the heart of Paris on the banks of the Seine. The Musée d'Orsay is one of the most iconic monuments of the French capital. Its environment is just as grandiose. It faces former royal residences, the Louvre and the Tuileries. We're at the heart of Paris, of monumental Paris, and at the same time, the heart of mythical Paris, around the Seine. Orsay from the inside is even more striking. With its imposing nave, 138 meters long by 32 meters high, almost as high as the nave of Notre Dame, which reaches 33 meters. The volume is absolutely colossal. It's a real shock when you enter. You can tell you're in a special museum. You can see it, you can feel it. Orsay is indeed the only great museum in the world in a former Belle Epoque railway station, built at the turn of the 20th century. And this exceptional station hides an astonishing structure. In the nave, what we see are the 35,000 square meters of glass and the 1,600 staff coffers that decorate the vault. On the outside, we see wide facades carved from stone in the pure French tradition. But if we could remove one by one the stones that make up these facades, we'd discover an impressive metal heart hidden in the rock. From the outside, it looks like a stone building, but in fact, its whole structure is metallic. We're no longer in a conventional technology where facades are connected by beams and we put in floors and a roof. No, it's an entirely metal structure. Inside the museum, the pillars and the wrought iron decorations still testify to this colossal framework. It took no less than 12,000 tons of metal to build Orsay. A significant figure, given that the Eiffel Tower itself only required 7,300 tons. The Orsay railway station was in fact completed in 1900, the heyday of metal construction, just 11 years after the Eiffel Tower. More modern than it seems, the design of the Orsay superstructure resembles those of the first American skyscrapers of the late 19th century with stone playing a purely decorative role. The structural load-bearing role is played by the metal framework. To seek out the secrets of this exceptional station, we must examine the event that caused it to be built. The Paris Exposition of 1900. With its wide avenues and unique monuments, the face of modern-day Paris was largely crafted in the 19th century, and in 1900, the French capital was at its zenith. In 1900, Paris is a city of light radiating throughout Europe and the world. From April to November 1900, Paris further boosted its prestige by holding the new Exposition Universelle. A spectacular event dedicated to the glory of human genius, only 11 years after the one that inaugurated the Eiffel Tower. And the 1900 Paris Exposition beat all records with more than 50 million visitors. 1900 was to be the big expo. La France. France was rich, very rich, so for the Paris Exposition, the city fathers decided to remodel Paris. Some 112 hectares of prestigious facilities were built for the occasion, right at the heart of Paris. With spectacular superstructures like the Grand Palais or great technological innovations like the first line of the Paris Metro. 
The exposition, Universal, is very important. It's about showing the whole world the reality of the country's industrial power. The Paris Orléans Railway Company, which owned the second longest rail network in France, seized this unique opportunity. To welcome the exposition's millions of visitors in style, it proposed to build a grandiose station, the Orsay Station. The railway symbolized the high-tech prosperity of the time. What was needed was a beautiful station, beautiful and also remarkable. Orsay wouldn't be a simple station. It must be a temple to rail. Monumental, futuristic, a laboratory of railway innovation, worthy of the Exposition Universelle. It's a modern station of a type never before seen. But in central Paris, it was hard to find a suitable location for such an ambitious station that had to handle 150 trains per day. The Exposition Universelle was held near the Eiffel Tower on the banks of the Seine in an already highly urbanized area. Fortunately, there remained a strategic site just 700 meters from the planned entrance to the Expo. The ruins of a former palace, the Palais d'Orsay. This monument had been built in 1830 to house the Court of Audit. On the Orsay site stood the Court of Audit, a grand institution that checks the state's books, etc. But the Palais d'Orsay would last only 41 years. It was torched in 1871 during the Paris Commune. The Palais d'Orsay burned down, much of it, and remained a ruin. For 30 years, they didn't know what to do with it. So on this land, miraculously available in the centre of Paris, they'd be able to build a new station. This colossal project involved raising the ruins of the Palais d'Orsay and building in its place, from scratch, a high-tech station in a record time of two years. It would have to be done very quickly, as there was a key deadline, the Exposition Universal. All large urban stations are very difficult stations to make. That's why most stations open after a considerable delay. So how would they manage to build this exceptional station in just two years? The engineers would indeed find themselves faced with a major challenge to build a monumental station on a plot that was far too small and to have railway lines arrive in the heart of Paris without destroying everything around it. The Palais d'Orsay site was chosen for its strategic location, but it didn't suit the construction of a large station. Right in the center of Paris, only 42 meters from the Seine. Orsay is in the city center. Surrounded by buildings, there's no possibility of overflow. There was an awful lot of urban growth, which hindered the project. The available space was also far too small. Even after acquiring a neighboring plot, the buildable area was only 13,000 square meters, a rectangle 173 meters long by 75 meters wide. An engineering review at the time estimated that 25 to 30,000 square meters were needed, more than double. And just to make it more difficult, for reasons of profitability, they want to add a grand hotel. On this limited site, the Paris Orléans engineers must find room for a station in a vast 370 room hotel. To achieve this feat, they must devise a monument with an innovative configuration that optimizes each available square meter. It was tricky because the building was needed, the traveler needs his space. So they took advantage of the small plot, maximizing some things as well as compressing the hotel. These constraints explain the monument's unique configuration almost stuck to the neighboring building. On the other side, the large glass tympanum, 
where the clock hangs is also enclosed behind the front of a building. On two sides, the hotel frames the nave of the station, spreading its 370 rooms over five stories. The hotel, which extends over several levels, would totally mask the rear of the station. The station, meanwhile, should have 15 lines, but the monument isn't wide enough. The engineers would find the space needed by digging down five meters all around the monument. We imagined these underground lines that would arrive in the station itself. Some tracks were slightly hidden under the Quai d'Orsay, others nearer the hotel. The design of Orsay station made the most of the available space. But they must also find a way to bring the railway to the station in the middle of Paris. Once again, the solution would be found underground. As they built Orsay Station, they also, of course, built the tunnel linking it to Austerlitz Station. Before the construction of its Orsay Station, the Paris Orléans Company's terminus was Austerlitz, in the east of Paris. The tracks must therefore be extended to the new Orsay Terminus. And to connect the two stations, a tunnel some 3,650 meters long must be dug across the historic heart of the French capital. This tunnel is a real engineering challenge because it must run alongside the Seine. There are bridge abutments and there's the Seine digging in in every direction. A tunnel that follows the course of the Seine is vulnerable to flooding. Work began on the tunnel in April 1898. Its course must be perfectly judged and as shallow as possible to avoid seepage from the Seine. We used the shield technology, which allowed us to dig with mechanical diggers. It removes the rock while building up the tunnel masonry. The tunneling shield was the ancestor of the tunnel boring machine, a metallic structure mounted on 10 hydraulic cylinders, which could advance up to 9 meters per day. At the front was a beak, under which the workers cleared away the rock. At the rear, the body of the shield served as a support to build the vault of the tunnel. This technology was used in the metro, except that the gauge was wider. To fit trains 3.1 meters down the tunnel, the Paris Orléans Company designed one of the largest shields ever made, a structure 9 meters wide, equipped with an innovative lateral guidance system to draw curves and flawlessly circumvent obstacles. Thanks to this extraordinary project, which mobilized 300 workers, the tunnel was completed in just 16 months. And this exploit also involved another major innovation, the use of electricity. When we built Orsay Station, we knew trains would arrive with electric locomotives so as not to spread smoke in the tunnels. If we'd kept steam locomotives, the passengers would have ended up smoked like kippers. But in France, at the turn of the 20th century, all the trains were steam-powered. So trains at Austerlitz Station would have to change locomotives just to pass through the tunnel. These were the first electric locomotives in France, especially designed for Orsay Station. Electric traction began in 1900 in Orsay in France. In this regard, the station appears to be experimental, a station of the future. Visitors to the Musée d'Orsay today don't always notice it. But just below the entrance, you can spot a few relics of the old station platforms. Here we are at the lower level, which is where the trains arrived. We can imagine how the platforms were thanks to the pillars that are still here, 
as they carry the entire structure. More than 200 cast iron pillars are distributed underground at platform level. They support the ground floor of the station and in particular the entire metal frame of the monument. The whole metal structure is immense. We know that the pillars, at certain structural points, can take up to 600 tons of load. But what are the secrets of this gigantic metal frame so well hidden in the stone? The station's architect came up with an amazing superstructure whose construction techniques are reminiscent of those of the Eiffel Tower. To build the Orsay station, the Paris Orléans company chose a well-known architect, Victor Laloux. Victor Laloux was already known. At the time he entered the Orsay station competition, he was working on the one at Tours station. It's still architecture with one eye on the past, but with the new techniques of our time. Rather academic in style, Laloux was also a modernist and a great connoisseur of metal construction, of which this was the golden age. In 1900, the thinking was that a three-dimensional metal structure was a passport to anything. It made possible the skyscrapers that were shooting up in New York and Chicago. Victor Laloux planned to use all of the possibilities of metal in particular its solidity, especially as the station was only 42 meters from the Seine. The foundations were difficult to build as the ground was very boggy. To build the station on solid foundations, they had to begin by raising the ruins of the Palais d'Orsay. The first phase of the work began in April 1898, at the same time as the tunnel. Of the 30,000 cubic meters of stone from the former palace, 10,000 was reused to build blocks of masonry, five meters below the ground floor at future platform level. These blocks provide a powerful bedrock for 200 metal pillars, which themselves support 41 rows of transverse beams. This network of metal beams forms a powerful floor upon which the entire framework of the station can rest. We have a metal floor system that allows for wider spans, which limits the support points, and that's what's interesting. We therefore built a huge structure, entirely in metal, with rounded metal ribs for the ceilings. The solidity of the floor made it easy to create an unobstructed interior space, with a huge nave, 40 meters wide by 32 meters high and a succession of seven domes all along the Great Hall. For this precision work, Victor Leloup used the same metal as the Eiffel Tower, puddled iron. Puddled iron was widely used from 1850. It's a technology that takes pig iron and creates a wrought iron that is more malleable. The construction techniques of the metal structure of Orsay were also fairly close to those of the Eiffel Tower, with parts prefabricated in the workshop. They were then assembled on site with rivets. We see these rivets, which really are the signature of this technology and which ensure resistance and real durability. Thanks to these optimized techniques, and also to the use of powerful mechanical devices like this 32-meter crane, the job would be completed within two years. But Victor Leloup would also hide its modern metal structure, the better to blend into the Orsay environment. There was no question of leaving the metal structure visible where the station was, in the centre of Paris facing the Louvre. This is more than just a technological space. 
the challenge is to design a monumental station. On three of the four sides of the monument, Lelou thus designed large facades in the purest French tradition, composed of 8,000 cubic meters of sculpted stone. But these facades are but an imposing decoration, created with the same techniques as American skyscrapers. We already have skyscrapers 200 meters high in New York, for example, metal structures with stone cladding. The Orsay facades are, in reality, only simple stone walls, two meters thick. They are just placed on the metal structure below and on the side, and are retained by anchors, metal bars embedded in the stone. The station is simply clad in stone. It's like we built a wall to finally shut out metal architecture. It's above the nave, in the attics of the monument, that we notice the load-bearing role of this metal framework. This is what's known as Orsay's second skin, a very ordered network of metal beams along the entire length of the nave. It's a forest of metal, which underpins the stability of the work, and of the vault especially. The double skin affords access to the vault through these openings cut in the glass roof, in harness 20 meters up. Rope access technicians are restoring part of the nave's 1600 staff coffers, or caissons. Coffering decorated with rosettes, embedded in the metal structure, designed by Victor Lelou to give his station an antique look. Directly inspired by the baths of Caracalla, which were Roman baths of considerable volume. Architect Lalou can allow himself the luxury of interior decoration and gilding. Very refined, the Orsay station, from its opening in 1900, was a real technological gem. To accommodate up to 150 trains per day, engineers used innovative equipment to ensure optimum comfort for passengers. The Orsay station was a laboratory for railway innovation. For electricity, everything ran on electricity. Ahead of its time, the station was entirely lit by electricity. It also boasted one of the very first monumental electric clocks with a diameter of four and a half meters. But above all, this new energy powered a revolutionary luggage system. The fact that there were two floors posed handling problems, and that's why we created elevators. Don't forget that in 1900, elevators aren't widespread. It really is an innovation that electricity, this new energy vector, allows at this time. The station's 12 elevators enabled luggage to be raised and lowered at a speed of one meter per second. Another innovation enabled by electricity, these inclined aloe fiber conveyor belts hoist luggage eight meters above the platforms to a dedicated space behind the clock. People collect their luggage from a bench where it's displayed, just like in an airport today. But this pioneering station soon became obsolete. With the increase in traffic, the monument again came up against its original problem, the lack of space. When it was built, it was fine. It was big, vast, but it soon became too cramped. In 1912, just 12 years after its inauguration, the Paris Orléans Company were looking to extend the Orsay station. It states that during busy periods, the station wasn't up to the task of handling traffic flows. 
The cost of the work needed to extend the station was estimated at 16 million old francs, a colossal sum equal to around 64 million euros today. They considered extending downwards, but it was impossible. They'd have to dig under buildings again, mammoth works. Faced with these difficulties, the Paris Orléans company chose to gradually abandon its prestigious Orsay station. Just before the Second World War, they decided to halt the main line trains, so the station only lived for 30 years. And it would be a long sleep for the Sleeping Beauty. Even if some suburban trains continued to run, the station was forgotten and the sumptuous nave gradually deteriorated. Here we are with the building of significant scale. And the question is, what do we do with the vessel? 